All right. So I launched Idle by going to the search box and typing Idle and hitting Return. Idle is our programming editor. And then once Idle came up, I did File, New File. I need to save it somewhere. When you do Save As, it always defaults to the worst possible directory to save it in. I guess it'd be even worse if it, you know, defaulted to Windows System or whatever, you know. But you can see here that it's in the guts of the Python program directory structure. Don't save stuff in there. It'll work for a while, and then you'll wind up breaking Python to the point where you have to uninstall it and reinstall it. And if you do it at school, then Python is broken, and you can't uninstall it and reinstall it. And you have to go down to the CIT office and ask them, you know, beg them to, to fix it. And it's embarrassing. So never save things into the, you know. Python 3632 program files directory. Instead, we want to make our own directory. You can stick your own directory in documents. You can stick it in desktop. Usually, I create it and then drag it over into favorites to make it really easy to find. If you use a flash drive, that's totally cool. I love flash drives until I lose it a week later. So, you know, Noah are probably better at managing them than I am. But the flash drive is a good idea because you never know when the machine will be taken away and swapped with another one and then you lose all your work. You know, maybe the hard drive failed or, you know, the network, uh, you know, something's wrong with it. And so, you know, machines swap all the time. Or you come in and somebody else is sitting at your desk and rather than get into a fight about it, right. So, might want to use a flash drive. It's too bad that we can't configure these things, you know, with a, a Google Drive directory so that you could carry that stuff around. You could always use Google Drive anyways, right? You can drag files to it, but it's, it's more cumbersome. All right, so I want to create a directory. I'm going to go to desktop. And I don't particularly like the icon view. I'm a nerd and I like lists. So I'm going to come over here and click on this little box next to the question mark and say list. That makes me happier. I'm going to make a new folder. I could just stick everything on the desktop, right? You know, I keep a messy desktop in my office. Why not? But instead, I want a folder. So I'm going to click new folder. I don't care what you call your folder. I like calling it CIT1113. And on these machines, this stuff is private to you, so you don't have to put your own name on it to differentiate it from somebody else's. But if you want to, that's fine. All right. I have a folder where I'm going to be putting everything. And like I said, I like to drag it over to the favorites. And why am I talking about all this stuff? I know that some of y'all are Mac users, and you may not, you know, may not use Windows every single day. So I'm going to drag that CIT. 1113 over here under favorites, so it says create link in favorites, and now I'll always just be able to click on that no matter what directory I'm in and get to it. All right, I need to create a file name for this. I label my lectures by days rather than by dates. And so this is lecture A, the next one's lecture B, the next one's lecture C, and so on. Then the homework assignments are numbered. So if I tell you to go access program C, you know that that's not a homework program. It's a lecture program. And if I tell you to go and find your homework, if I tell you to find program three, it means go to you know your homework and find that program that you wrote. But anyways, I'm just going to call this a.py. That's pretty boring. You, know, you could call it a, you know, and then tack your initials on. You really shouldn't use spaces in a programming language file name. A lot of languages don't let you do that. This won't let you do it, but I, I'm, I don't do it. I'm just going to call it a. If I wanted to add my name to it, I might, you know, use an underscore, you know, the shift uh, of the minus sign mixed to the zero. Uh, I'm just going to call it A, or maybe lecture A. How about that? Then I'm going to do a save, and I'm ready to write a little program. This program is going to be pretty trivial. It's just going to ask for my name, and then it's going to say hello, followed by my name, and it's done. Then after that, after all this excitement, what we'll do is we'll dip into the syllabus, and then if we have time, we'll come back to this program. All right, so name equals input, parentheses, in parentheses. And then just save it. You can save it multiple ways. You could run the program, and it'll ask you if you want to save it. You could do file save. You could hit control S. That's what I do. You know, you, you tend, after using a program for, you know, for 10 years, you, you learn the keyboard shortcuts, so Control-S. So you'll probably never see me save it because I'll just do Control-S and I won't tell you that I'm doing it. But it's no big deal because if you run the program, it asks you to save it. All right, now I'm going to run it. 
Now this window has got too much information in it, so I'm going to close this shell. When I run it, it's going to reopen it. It tells me a program is running, and that's a fact, but okay. I'm not going to close this one. This is my program. I'm going to run it again. All right, it sits there blinking. I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. What I wanted to be able to do is to type in my name, and sure enough, I can, but I didn't know I was supposed to type in my name, so that's a bad program. You always need to tell the user what they're going to do. So we're going to add a print statement telling the user, you know, what is your name, or please enter name, or something like that. Close the shell again. I'd like to close it as often as possible. So above the name statement, print, parentheses, you know, shift nine, quote, what is your name, question mark, end quote, in parentheses. Now here we go. Now I'm going to run it again. You know, just like uh, voting in Chicago, I say, you know, run early, run often. You know, you, you always want to keep your, uh, your program in a state where it doesn't have errors in it, and the fastest way to discover the errors is to run it. All right, what is your name? Jeff. All right, so for you folk who just came in, what I'm going to do is uh, after the end of class, I'm going to have this back up on the screen so that you can catch back up. You know, you can have something to turn in for today. All right, we asked for the name, but we don't do anything. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to create another variable that holds a message like good morning, comma, you know, or followed by the name. So display... And by the way, you don't have to make variable names long. I could just use D equals. Single letter variable names are really bad taste, right? But they're easy to type. So sometimes I will use single letter variable names. I'm just going to use D in this case. I'm going to do the wrong thing. You should use descriptive variable names like name rather than in. You know what a name is. You don't know what in is, you know, intuitively just looking at it. Okay, so D is equal to, quote, good after afternoon, comma, space, end quote, plus, I guess I, yeah, followed by their name, and then another plus sign, and a quote, and an exclamation, end quote. And then let's print that out. Print, parentheses, D, end parentheses. And by the way, I type fast, and if you need me to slow down, let me know. Just go, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I'll love you for telling me to slow down. <clears throat> I'm going to run it again, see if it works. Now, sometimes I intentionally put syntax errors in to show you how to correct them. I'm not intending to fix a display to fix those at this point. What's your name? Jeff. Good afternoon, Jeff. Okay, we have a program that asks for input. It does something with it. It processes the input, and it displays the output. So our, that's our program. If you have a syntax error, if it's not running, like for example, a syntax error is when I don't follow the grammar exactly. What if I left off the quote? I mean, you know, the end quote. You always have to have matching quotes. If I take, don't, don't do this because I just broke the program. Boom, it displays an error message and it's pretty cryptic at this point. By the way, I've almost lost my voice. That's why it sounds gravelly. All righty. So I'm going to add that back. That's my program. I am good to go. Hopefully it works for y'all. Like I said, you know, maybe we can end the class five minutes early so I have time to wander around if y'all have syntax errors. All right, let's do the syllabus, the most exciting part of the lecture. So what you're going to want to do is log into D2L, find our class section, Go to content, you know, if you want to follow along with the syllabus. Find class information. Click on class information. And I don't know what I've done on this computer to get it to where it's not displaying a tree, right? Where you click on the folder and then that, uh, you know, we can see all the contents of that folder while still seeing everything else. Your, yours may look a little bit different, but class information, syllabus. Alright, now this syllabus has the wrong date and time. I apologize for that. I will fix that. But hopefully since you're here, you know the correct date and time. 
Whenever you see something in the preview mode inside D2L, that's great and all, but by the time we start looking at PowerPoints, you're always going to want to download the PowerPoints. The preview mode for the PowerPoint stinks. And also, when you're checking your homework assignment, download your homework assignment rather than view it in the preview. Because sometimes the preview skips stuff. And if you don't have all the information, it's going to be hard to do the program. How do you download something? You can either go to the bottom and click download, or there's a little drop down menu here. Download. But this button's bigger, so I'm going to scroll down to the bottom and click download. Open it in Word. <clears throat> Of course, you can't read all this on my screen. Make the font bigger, mess up the formatting. How about that? All right, what is this? An introductory course in developing both procedural and object oriented logic. Let's try to scare you off by using these fancy words for problem solving. Utilizing several program development tools and techniques, including tra traditional flowcharts. If you ever took a programming course in the past, you know what a flowchart is, and it's probably annoying. We do have to learn flowcharts, but we're not going to write one for every program. You know, once we learn it, then we'll only do a couple of them. You got to learn it though, because there are test questions over it, and it makes you a better, you know, better programmer. Even if you don't go on to do programming, you know, for the rest of your life, useful information helps you think logically. Pseudocode. Pseudocode is when you describe something in English, right? I just wrote a program, but if I was going to write pseudocode, I might say, ask the user for their name, build a display string. You know, print the display string. You hear me describing it in English. Now, I would probably do something that's a little bit more rigorous than that, but that's the idea. That's pseudocode. And a programming language. We'll present the core concepts of writing computer programs. Variables? That's what we know. We've done that. Decisions, loops, functions. We've just used some functions. And objects, which apply regardless of the programming language. That's the cool thing about programming, is that once you learn one language, you're halfway there to learning another one. And once you've learned two programming languages, you're three quarters of the way to learning a third one because of concepts. You know, it's kind of like those Romance languages, you know, that they speak in Europe where, you know, Portuguese and Spanish kind of have similar syntax and stuff like that. Even though, you know, they're different languages, they share a lot of stuff. And so by the time you learn one, it's easier to learn another. Or maybe it's harder because you get confused between the two. I don't know. I don't learn those languages. I took Spanish in high school. The course is designed to assume no programming experience. Although, if you have it, took high school class, or you did it on your own, you know, that's totally cool. A script programming language, Python, will be introduced. It didn't have to be Python. We've used other languages in the past, and some instructors didn't even do any programming in the logic class in the past. Now, I think that's insane. I can't imagine being a student sitting down, you know, watching somebody lecture for, you know, an hour and a half every day without getting to do any programming. This seems pointless to me, but that's the way some instructors did it in the past, and no shame, you know, they were good instructors. But nowadays, everybody has to do that. All your, all your classes will learn Python if they're the intro. All right, so that's my name. My office is right downstairs, the other end of the hall downstairs. I have office hours. They're posted in D2L. And also next to my door. This is my phone number. My phone number is really cool in as much as you can send me text messages day or night. I'm usually up until 1 a.m., 2 a.m., you know, so if you're writing your homework day or night, send me a text message. Ask me for help. What I'll probably ask you to do is to take a picture of your code, right? You know, we have these modern miracle tools. You take a picture, snapshot of your code, you text it to me, you say it's working wrong, you might send me a picture of the results as well, right? Because when I ran it, we saw the window, you know, like that. You know, send me a picture of both of them, and then I might be able to diagnose it like within two minutes, you know, rather than you spending two hours trying to figure it out. Now, honestly, the act of spending two hours trying to figure something out may be educational, right? You may learn it a little bit better. On the other hand, you know, time is limited, and if you can get something solved in two minutes by asking me, I certainly think that that's a good idea. So, to encourage you to use my phone, and to let me text you if something's going on, like I know that, uh, you know that I'm sick that morning. If I am sick, I would post a message in D2L. I would send an email, but I'll also text everybody whose phone number I have. So if you would be so kind, grab your phone, send me a text at that message, at, excuse me, at that number, and just put your name followed by the class. 
CIT 1113. <clears throat> and I never use this stuff. You have your number for anything other than class related material. At the end of the semester, I delete your number. So even if you had me in another class, please send it to me again. So that's my phone number. Here's my email address. Please email me as much as you want, but on the other hand, if you send me a text saying I sent you email, then I will know to go and check my email right then. Um, you know, otherwise I might not notice it until the evening or something like that. Or you know, if, if a day has gone by and you haven't gotten an answer, it's not rude for you to send me a text message saying go check my email, right? Because I get, you know, like most of y'all do, 700 messages a day and it's possible to miss some. Alright, so we know the course, fundamentals of programming, no prereqs, delivery method, hybrid, lecture and online. Sometimes that means that, you know, the instructor will be posting lectures and material that, you know, they don't cover in class. I pretty much cover everything in class, but I do video. I do, you know, use the camera program in order to record everything on my screen and my voice. So if you miss a lecture, you can still watch the lecture. If you miss a lecture, what I want you to do is watch it. And if you're capable of doing it, type along with what I'm doing in the video, just like we do in class. Now, if you can't because you can't, you know, put two windows on your screen at the same time or, you know, it's, it's annoying to do that, there's a form you can fill out that, you know, I watch the video and here are the four things I learned from it. You know, and that'll prove to me that you watch the lecture. Either way will work. If you miss a class and you don't watch the lecture, though, you're going to be behind. And you do get credit for everything you upload into the daily lecture Dropbox that I create. So you're going to want to put something there. You know, even if it was just I attended class today and it was awesome, right? You know, I'm kidding about the awesome. You don't have to say that. You know, do upload something into the Dropbox every single time because you get points to it. All right. We have a textbook. You don't have to buy the physical textbook. I probably would not buy the physical textbook. Why? Because when you get MindTap, which you do need to do some of the assignments, you know, to get credit for it, um, the textbook is bubbled into it so you can read it online. And I think they even have an app, you know, for your tablet or whatever that will, you know, interact with MindTap and maybe let you read a textbook like a Kindle book. I need to try that out. So, you know, you can go to the bookstore and get the code, you know, that you're going to type in, or you can just access MindTap straight from here. And the first time you access it, it will ask, ask you, you know, if you want to buy it right on the spot. So yeah, if you have a Pell Grant or something, you, you, you want to buy it from the bookstore, so you have tra uh, you know paper trail and get reimbursed. But otherwise, you know, you can go to content, and you don't have to do this right now. See engage, follow one of the links. It'll open up a window. And it'll ask for some information. Now, I've already logged on to see Engage, so I'm not seeing the same thing you would, but it asked me the option to, uh, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, to, uh, you know, buy it right on the spot. If you have more than one class using MindTap and see Engage, you want to buy something called Unlimited because it costs more, but then all your books are already covered, you know, for every class. So if you have two or three classes, it's a bargain. And it's possible that if you've bought MindTap, a MindTap code for a single class that you may be able to upgrade it to Unlimited. I heard that you can do that. I don't know how to do it because, you know, I get a free MindTap account. Lucky me for being an instructor. So you're going to want to get that pretty soon, you know. It's, I didn't expect you to have it today, but, you know, by next week, please have MindTap access. And there's a free trial period, so if you don't have your money yet to buy it, then you can get that, but the trial's going to run out, you know. You're going to have to buy it. We also use an online site separate from MindTap. Yeah. It's called uh, How to Think Like a Computer Scientist. You know, so if I hit Control and click on it, it'll take me to that website. I'll tell you when we need to use it. You know, and it's got you know all sorts of useful information about the Python programming languages, Python specific, as opposed to the MindTap thing. Like I mentioned, that one covers a lot of languages, examples, and a lot. You're going to want to install Python 3 at home. 
And as a matter of fact, your first homework assignment is going to be installing Python 3 on your computer. Now, one time I had somebody say that the only computer they had was a Chromebook. You could still do the majority of your homework using a Chromebook, but contact me about it. There'll be like a couple of assignments you may not be able to do it, and you'll have to do it on a computer at school. Otherwise, if you have Mac, Linux, you know, any flavor of Windows, you can install Python on it. It's a small program. does not take a lot of time to install. It does not bog your machine down. Nothing wrong with installing it. There's also a flowcharting program we use. There's a free one, but if you own Microsoft Office, it also comes with a flowcharting program. We're going to use the free one because it's compatible with you know every computer you've got. All right, I kind of covered this already with the goals, but we're going to understand fundamental concepts and general principles of programming, such as Calibri 20. No, wait, that's not what we're learning. Loops, decision statements, and input and output. We're going to understand and create flowcharts and pseudocode to understand program logic, and then we're going to write Python programs. The grade scale is pretty traditional. 90% is an A, 80% is a B, 70% is a C, and so on. People ask me if I curve the grades. I don't curve the grades, but that's because the material and the way I present it tends to get, you know, like more than a third of the class making A's. And I don't mind doing that, right? You know, I want y'all to learn the material. This is not supposed to be a cut course that's, you know, going to kick you out of the program. It's something to help you learn. I don't mind giving out a lot of A's. So there's never a reason to curve. On the other hand, if you're, you know, right on the borderline and you're making an 89 and 0.5, I'm not going to be a jerk and give you a B on it. Like I, I put up to 0.5 points. If we look at the uh, grades are broken down, we'll see that a third of it is based on the homework. It's not formatted correctly because I boosted the font size right. A third of it is based on what you turn in every day you come. And like I said, you can just turn in um, a note that says I attended class, or you can turn in a note that, you know, that's all the notes you typed in if you're one of the people who likes to take, you know, typewritten notes. Either way, just turn something in. That means that you've already started the class off with 33% of the total 100 points required just by coming to class and uploading something every day. Kind of a heads up, maybe that's why you know more than a third of the class makes A's. But if you don't show up, and if you're not watching the lectures, and you're not uploading stuff into it, it's going to directly hurt your grade, even apart from not learning, right? So that's an encouragement. So homework is a third, the in-class uploads are a third, and then the quizzes and exams are a third. The quizzes are based in my tab. I may give y'all extra quizzes as well. I'm not really big on handing out pop quizzes, so, uh, so maybe I should to encourage attendance, but nah. So submitting homework. Apart from those quizzes that you have to use MindTap for, you will upload all your homework into the D2L assignments folder. And this is the last semester where D2L exists. Some students and some instructors are already using Canvas for their classes this semester. You may like Canvas better than D2L. Grading policy. If a program has a syntax error, when you give it to me, you won't get any credit for it. Or you'll get one out of 100, which is to indicate that I did grade it, right? Because if you see a zero, you don't know whether I looked at it or not. But if you see a one, you know that it was uh, you know, rejected with extreme prejudice for not running. Oh, no, no syntax errors. That means the program has to be perfect. No, but it has to run. And you know right off the bat if there's a syntax error. For example, say that I did this. I made a mistake. I called the variable d here, but I typed a dd here. Or what if I uppercased a function name? Right? That's easy to do. You know, it's a, it's a, a newbie mistake. You uppercase something that's not supposed to be uppercased. You run it. it. Kicks out an error message. You knew right away before you uploaded it that it didn't work. Right? It's like turning in a, a you know a term paper that's blank, right, or that's only one paragraph long. You knew what you were doing. So don't upload something that doesn't run, right? You know, I'm, I'm probably not going to even look at the code. Or I might look at the code to see what mistake you made. Because what if it's one little mistake? <coughs> what if out of 2,000 lines of code, you capitalize one letter? You know, what if you accidentally made a change as you were uploading it? Hello. Yeah, I get that. So I might look at it and spot the error, and if it's a single thing, I might tell you what you need to do to fix it. Otherwise, I'll just say, program doesn't run. Redo it. The redo it is the key thing there, right? 
you didn't just fail the assignment because you uploaded it with a syntax error. I almost always offer you the chance to redo something, right? If it's got a syntax error, I absolutely want you to redo it. That's why you get a one out of a hundred. If it just doesn't do the right thing, right? What if I, you know, our program displayed, you know, good evening. What if I told you to make it say good morning? Or what if I told you to look at the time and make it say good morning or good evening based on the, you know, whether it was before noon or afternoon? Well, what if it always printed good evening anyways? Well, that might be worth half credit because it didn't look at the time and decide, right? So you get partial credit for stuff that runs but doesn't fulfill all the requirements. But what I'll do is I'll say what it does wrong. The program was supposed to, you know, change the message based on the time. And then I'll say, please revise it and re-upload it for full credit or more credit, maybe not full credit, right? You know, your program might be, you know, you might have turned it in late to begin with, and I'll talk about late penalties in a minute. So, and you probably are not going to get full credit for something that's too late. But anyways, so you almost always have a second chance, right? Because in the real world, you write, you know, you do something, and then if it doesn't do it perfectly, you know, then you go and you fix it, right? Yeah. If you were getting paid to do something and, and you didn't do a great job the first time, you'd probably go back and fix your, your mistakes. So partial credit may be awarded for assignments that do not meet the full criteria. I told you to calculate the value of pi and it wound up printing, you know, four. Well, you know, maybe the rest of the program is good, but it didn't calculate pi correctly, you know, so you get partial credit. You know, whether it's a passing grade, a 70 or an 80 or a 90 or a failing grade is up to how many of the criteria I think you missed. If you only receive partial credit, you may revise and resubmit the program to get more credit. The only time I'm not going to let you revise your program probably, probably is if you cheated on it. And we'll talk about more about that later. It's like, you know, if you cheated on it, then I'm not going to respect that effort enough to even let you, revi uh, you know, revise it and resubmit it. In general, programming assignments are due one week from the day, you know, the assign. So I am going to give you homework, which is to install Python to prove that you have it on your machine at home, or to tell me, no, I'm not going to do that, and I'm just going to use the computers at school. You need to do one of those two things. That's your homework assignment. It's due a week. you got to do it by, you know, you have to turn it in by next Tuesday. Now, when I say turn it in by next Tuesday, I'm going to set a due date of Monday at midnight. But I'm not going to come down on you if you do it the next morning. Right, you know, you have that day's grace period. Homework assignment that is turned in on time will get a 5% grade bonus, right? So if I'm giving out, you know, um, 10 points per homework assignment, then, uh, wait, well, you know, 100 points per, then I'll give you 105. And that's kind of nice, right? It'll pump, plump up your grade a little bit. So that if you don't do great on a later program, you know, maybe it'll average out to a good thing anyways. That's to encourage you to get your homework in on time. On the flip side, that is a deduction for getting too late. It's a 10% per week deduction, and I ought to be more aggressive than that. You know, I ought to say 25 points off per week or something like that, because if you're falling behind on your homework, you're not getting the concepts of the lecture either. And so generally, once you start getting behind, you start doing really bad. It's really important to keep up, pretty much. So if you miss a lecture, I recommend doing the lecture within a week. Watch it over the weekend or whatever, your first moment. And, you know, I'm never mad at people for missing lectures. I understand you get sick or your kids are, you know, you got to do this or the weather's bad. Oh, by the way, if the weather's bad but the school isn't canceled, I don't care. Don't come in if you don't feel safe for driving or if you have to take care of your kids or something like that, right? You know, home life is important. Um, your personal safety is important. You don't want to get out, that's fine, you know, even if school's not canceled. Take care of yourself. You know, you can always watch the lectures. That's why I video them. Anyways, 10% off for a week. You know, up to seven days late, it's 10% off. You know, two weeks is another, is 20%, three weeks. But it has to be done within a month, right? So don't be one of the people who wait until the end of the semester, find out that they're failing the course, and then ask if they can make up all that work, right? Because if you did that, then you weren't learning the material to begin with. And at that point, you're so desperate that you're probably asking other people for work or something like that. It's a bad situation. Now, that doesn't mean that you can get into a situation, you know, you can get into a situation where real life interfered in such a bad way that you just flat out could not complete the course, right? That, that's a different matter. But if that's the case, I would work with you. It's kind of like doing an incomplete, 
we're not supposed to give out incompletes anymore, so I might give you a C or a D on it, but then I would work with you. I'd say, okay, you have four weeks to finish the class or something like that, and then we'd work together, and I would change your grade so that it appeared on the transcript as an A or whatever you finally wind up with. But anyways, no credit for anything more than four weeks late, whether it's homework or turning in something to show that you attended or watched the lecture. Now, the lectures don't have that sliding scale, right? It's either all or nothing. Get it done before a month is done. I have to change that to one week, right, or two weeks at the most to make sure that you keep caught up. Because what generally happens is that somebody misses a day, they watch the lecture, they think, hey, this is pretty cool. They don't feel as compelled to come to the next lecture, so they skip another lecture. Then they skip another lecture, and they kind of postpone doing the video because, yeah, it's kind of tedious to watch a YouTube video for an hour and a half typing along, right? You know, yeah, I don't want to do that. I, and then you miss another lecture, and you don't do the video, and your grade, you know, you progress to do that. So I should change this to you have to complete the in-class assignments in one week or two. But I made a month. I might waive your penalty for late assignments if you talk to me about it, particularly beforehand, you know. Yo, I'm going to go to Wisconsin and take care of my grandmother's, you know, estate, something like that. Yeah, I get that. Or, you know, I'm, I'm, my job's taking me out. Or, you know, you know, let me know. I've got, you know, I'm pregnant. I'm going to miss, you know, quite a bit of time for a while, you know, as, you know, the pregnancy ensues. I, I get that. You know, I'll work with you, but you got to talk to me about it. Don't come to me, you know, four weeks later and then explain why your homework was late and hope that you're going to get full credit. Talk to me about it. You know, you have my number. Attendance. I don't count off for attendance, but it's it's very important. And as a general rule, the students who do attend classes and don't miss many days perform better in the course. That doesn't mean you can just come in and not do the homework and ace the class. You've got to do the homework, too. It says incompletes will only be granted for students who are passing the class and have participated in the majority of the term. However, instructors are being encouraged to not give out incompletes at all. And so if I follow that encouragement, you know, which is given to me by my dean, what I would do is if you, you know, had to stop attending the class, you know, 10 weeks into it, I would give you the D or the C or whatever, but then I would offer you the chance to, you know, work with me after the end of the semester to, to boost it. Attendance and AWs. Fortunately, you all are here, so this does not matter. But just know, and I'm sure you've been told this from other instructors, that if you miss like the first week or the first two weeks of a class, it's bad news. You get kicked out of the class, probably irrevocably, and you get an AW on your transcript, and if anybody was giving you money to go to school and they paid for it, then they're going to come back and take the money personally from you. If you can't attend a class, it's far better to drop it, right? Probably get a refund than to just not show up. And it always mystifies me that I get any AWs at all. I've had somebody like not attend for the first three weeks, and then want to start attending, and then they say, I didn't know attendance was mandatory. And I said, did you read the, uh, the syllabus? And they go, no, I didn't. Um, I said, well, that means you did not do a single thing in the class. So I'm, no, you, know, you can't get into the class, and I'm sorry about that. It's, you have to come the first two weeks for a 16-week class, the first week for an eight-week class. That doesn't matter to y'all. All right, so what are you responsible for? You need to have access to DT stupid thing. I should just load this up as a PDF, but then I'd have to make a large font version. You have to have access to D2L and MindTap, right? And everybody has, you know, devices that will do that. You do need to read the text and keep up with the schedule, right? And that's, the uh, MindTap has end of chapter quizzes, so I am going to ask y'all to do those. Now, my quizzes are a little bit different than some instructors do because I let y'all retake the quiz, right? You only make an 80 on it, you want 100 average in the class, you can retake the quiz. I don't care if you retake the quiz 100 times, right, as long as you learn the material. I don't use the quizzes as a measuring device. I use the quizzes as a learning tool, right? And so if you learn the quizzes, you can make 100% on the quizzes, you're well on the way to being able to ace the exams as well because some of the exam material is drawn directly from the quizzes. I might not even modify the answers, you know, the questions, or I'll modify them just enough that, you know. Anyways, so you are going to be doing the quizzes. I want you to do them. It will hurt your grade if you're not doing them. All right, phones and stuff. I know that everybody anymore has their phone, and they probably have their phone out on their desk and stuff like that. If you're, if you're text messaging and stuff like that, not only put it on silent, you might mute the buzzing. 
right? Because if your phone is sitting on the desk and it's buzzing every three minutes, it's going to drive the person sitting next to you absolutely crazy. And then they'll complain to me in private and I'll have to come to you personally and that'll embarrass both of us. So, you know, just good etiquette. Don't put anything on your screen that's more interesting than I am. I had some folk and I didn't realize this, but they were watching Twitch videos. The, the two students right here were watching Twitch videos. Which meant, of course, that everybody in the second and the third row were watching Twitch videos with you because it's more, it's more fun than I am. And so finally I had to tell them not to do that, but I hadn't realized, you know, for a considerable time because every time I walked around, they would minimize it. But why are you even in the classroom, right? So just don't put anything on your screen that's more interesting than I am that's distracting for the people behind you. All right, expectations of me. Provide clear instructions for assignments. If you read the homework assignment and it doesn't make sense, it means I failed. So let me know. I will clarify the instructions and I'll probably post a clarification for everybody else. So it's good for the class. Never feel embarrassed to ask me for clarification or for help, right? Like I said at the beginning, I want y'all to, uh, you know, kick butt and beat the other class because the last time I had a class this large, you know, the class did considerably worse than the smaller class. So we're going to fight that. I will always answer your questions. Text them to me, you'll get a really fast response. Um, you know, phone is cool too. I actually prefer text, but you know, we can always talk on phone. Um, if you ask me an email, it's a good idea to text me as well, telling me to check my email so that I'll hop on it right away. I will grade your assignments. I will get feedback for stuff that needs to be corrected. I try to grade everything within a week so that you don't have to worry about it too long. I will always give you a week's notice of due assignments. I'm never going to come in on a Tuesday and tell you I want something done on Thursday. That's not fair. I'll always give you two weeks notice of exams. We, uh, we'll probably hammer out the uh, due dates, I mean the exam dates, you know, well in advance. Like by next week I should be able to tell you what days the exams are on. But you know, you'll always have at least two days. If you have to miss an exam, you can take it at the library at the test at the testing center, but there will be a window of time. You have to complete it within a certain amount of time. And I will post all the assignments, notices, and PowerPoints and stuff on D2L. All the due dates will be shown on D2L. I don't publish a separate schedule usually, you know, certainly not of the homework because you go to the assignments page and you see the due dates there. Academic integrity. This is really important. Here, I'll make it a little bit better. All right, did we get the message? No. All right, we're getting there. All right, all right, I'm belaboring the obvious, but I have to talk about it as well because I've had students do it. I even had students like to do it last semester. What is academic, what is cheating in this class? Cheating in this class is taking somebody else's assignment and, uh, and, uh, and submitting it as your own. I've even had students forget to change the initials, right? If you put your initials in the program, you know, Forget to change the initials. Um, often what happens is I'm stuck on a program and I'll ask you, hey, can I look at your program? Just send me your program so I can fix the one thing. It could be that I haven't even started and then I'm going to submit your program as though it were my own and then you're going to get a zero and you're going to be really unhappy at me. But, you know, don't share your work with somebody else. Don't ask anybody else for their work. Don't put them in that position. Don't work together on it and submit one copy, right? It's really easy for if two of y'all are in the same apartment using the same computer at home to write it together, right? And then submit, you know, both of them. I can't accept that, unfortunately, right? You may think that you both learned it, but probably one student wrote, you know, all of it and you're both submitting it together. So, does that mean that you can't help each other? Nah. If you come in early and you're stuck on your program and you and, and you all look at it and you know you make a couple of suggestions, I'm not gonna kill you for that. I'm not gonna, you know, that's cool. I see people working on homework together, you know, all the time. That's fine. I'm not gonna say that you can't help each other, right? But if you turn in identical work, if you turn in somebody else's work, that's cheating. The consequences are bad. What are the consequences? You will receive an F on that assignment. You know, and if it was like a term project, I don't get term projects in this class, but if it was a term project, that would totally sink your grade. I've had people do that. Um, also, the instance gets forwarded to the dean of the school, I mean of the uh, di this division. And worse, it gets forwarded to the director of student conduct who keeps permanent track so that, you know, 
everybody knows that it happened. Or if you cheat on two classes or something like that, then you can be kicked out of the school. You might be kicked out of the class. You might fail a class. So don't do it. What's another way that you could cheat? You're stuck on a problem. So you Google it. You're supposed to Google when you're stuck on programming problems. All programmers do that. You go and get knowledge, you know, because you can't learn all this stuff on your own. But I may ask you to write a program that does something that's a common assignment or a common programming problem. What if I ask you to write a program that calculates pi, right? I would probably, I would certainly give you a specific formula for calculating pi. I'd give you a specific algorithm. And then you get stuck on it, and so you Google up Calculate Pi in Python. You find a program that does it, you upload that program. It's not going to be written that, in a way that calculate, that follows my algorithm. It's not going to be written in a way that uses Python in a way that we've learned in here. It's going to be obvious. It's going to be absolutely obvious. You know, since I've looked at code for a long time, it's going to be absolutely obvious to me. And I will probably, within five minutes, be able to find the web page that you copied the program from. And then you're going to get to zero and this stuff's going to go down. Well, does that mean that I can't Google? No, what you do is when you're stuck on something, you know, I need to figure out how to, uh, you know, make Python open and save to a file. You go and you find an example of that. And then you adapt it and put it into your already existing program, right? Just like if you're writing a term paper. You're allowed to quote from a book if you're writing a term paper. But you better not copy a term paper, right? Somebody else's term paper. And you're supposed to give credit, right? Well, you don't have to give credit so much in programming. You learn it. By the time you're done with the program, if I ask you to sit down and in front of me rewrite the program or rewrite part of the program, you better be able to do that, right? I'm never going to do that to you unless I think you got the program somewhere else, right? And then I'll, I might ask you to do it to prove that you understand the material. Now, if I find it online, right, then I'm going to already know and I'm not going to ask you. It's just automatic F. All right, I'm talking about that a lot because it happens a lot, unfortunately. One of my projects that I assigned in other classes is to write a hangman program. You would not believe how many people go and find a hangman program from the internet and submit it. And it's just, it's just kind of sad. Also, don't communicate during exams. That's obvious, but I hate controlling. Um, and what, how could you cheat? You could open an instant messaging program. You could open up Gmail and start you know, sending emails to each other. I'm probably going to notice if you're typing on your phone, right? The books, oh. So don't do any of that stuff. Please don't do any of that stuff. I know exams can be hard, but they're not that hard because they're open book. You can get on MindTap. You can ask me. You can use your notes. I'll create a folder where you can upload anything you want to in there to help you on your exams, right? Because if you're doing a job, your boss is never going to come over and say, all right, I want you to do this, and you're not allowed to have any resources, and I want you to get it done in an hour, right? You know. Instead, what happens is you're asked to do a task, and you're allowed to use your resources. I don't want you to Google the answer, though. Using MindTap, using PowerPoints, using your notes, and best of all, you can ask me for help, right? Raise your hand. I'll come back. You know, you say, I don't understand this question. Can you rephrase it? Yeah, I'll rephrase it. And then I'll probably go up and tell everybody the rephrasing. Everybody will get it right. All right, free, free personal counseling. You know, we encounter stuff in our lives that make life hard. Trauma, grief, you know, abusive relationships, substance abuse, anything that's stopping you from achieving your goals. It's a good idea to go and talk to people about it. Not only is it free, which is awesome, the people here are actually good, which is even more awesome. So, you know, it's, it, it can be hard to take that first step when you need help, but why not, right? You know, they're not going to tell anybody. And it doesn't cost anything. I strongly encourage you to talk to them. They're good people. Student Support Services. It used to be called Americans with Disabilities Act. I mean, it still is. But, you know, we've changed the name of it to Student Access Services. But if you have, you know, things in your life, uh, capabilities that mean that stand in your way of learning, that's totally cool. You go and you talk to them and they'll fill out a form and you get to ask for extra stuff that will help you. Now the rest of you all may think that's unfair. I don't get the extra stuff. But the extra stuff is stuff like, I want to videotape the recordings. I mean, uh, the lectures. Eh, that's fine. 
you know, you'll probably just have a videotape of me sitting here typing and talking, but you know, that's totally cool. Or I need to sit on the front row. You know, or I need extra time for assignments. Or you know, this or that or the other. It's totally cool. But they'll fill out a, 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 you know, a form with you and then you bring the form to me and I'll abide by it. Right, I'll help you. I'll bend over backwards helping you. I'll also bend over backwards helping you even if you, you know, just ask me for help, right? I want you all to make A's. I want to give, you know, more than a third of the class A's. That's my goal. And then there's something called the Student Success Center. And I thought I had a web link to it. We're almost done. We're almost out of time. But you can Google up the Student Success Center. And what they do is they have workshops. Student Success Center, Rose State College. You know, workshops, study skills, connect with campus support, assessment of learning styles, academic advisement support. You know, ability to act in the public domain, women's selfhood, scholarships, unlock your potential to learn, math anxiety, resumes and job search, how to succeed in science courses, organizing, budgeting, I, I need that one, de-stressing, how to find your credit score and improve it. You know, cool stuff, not all of it directly academic related. It's free, right? You attend it, they look like they're, you know, a couple hours long, an hour, you know. Yeah, it might be worth looking at. All right, we're done. I need to create a folder for you to upload your program. And if uh, I didn't take a roll, so I will be taking a roll next time. But this time, I'm going to be taking a roll based on what you upload. So it's important to upload something. Even if you came in late and you didn't type in a darn thing, go and create a Word document or something saying, I attended class. Because as I already mentioned, there has to be something in the folder, and you get points for each day. Does anybody have any questions over that? And if you want to mull it over and ask questions next time, that's cool. Sometimes I forget to ask if anybody has any questions. I don't ask that often enough. All right, if you go to assignments, you'll see a drop box called First Program. I'm going to walk through uploading because you probably have already used D2L, but you may not have. So go to assignments. If you're not logged into D2L, that's a different problem. I don't know your password. I can't help you there. But get your password, log in, and upload something saying that you were here, and then you're good to go. All right, and then go to add a file from my computer. And then just go and find that file you created. Hopefully you remember what directory it was in. Or you can always use drag and drop. Drag and drop's cool and I never use it. Right, so you can just find the file and upload it. After you've done that, click Add. And then click Submit. Because it's like email. Just because you use a paper clip and, you know, and upload a Word document to your email program, the end user doesn't receive it until you click Send. The system doesn't receive it until you click Submit. And a lot of the time, people will say, I was there that day, but it didn't take my submission. And I believe you. But go to your computer and find the lecture for that day. If you lecture them in the same way that my folders are named, you know, I called it A, then you're good to go. But you're really good to go if you see this screen that says File Submission Successful. And apparently you get email saying you, you uploaded it. That would also serve to prove that you were there that day, right? But it's better just upload it. It serves as your notes, right? That stuff is sitting there waiting for you to look at it again. Now, I usually save what I type in here in additional notes into a folder in contents as well. And if you check contents after today, you'll see both our video and notes from today. The notes are not going to be much. You're going to see the code that we wrote because, you know, we spent a lot of time on the syllabus. But after this, we're going to do a lot of lecture, and I'll be typing in notes. I don't just rely on PowerPoints. I rephrase the PowerPoint and type in notes. All right. Now, we'll see you all next Tuesday. If you need help before then, I've told you all several ways of contacting me.